It's the 22nd of April as we're recording this podcast. It's a glorious day in the garden. You may even be able to hear the birds singing all around us while we're talking. It's Earth Day. And of course, it's also St George's Eve. So this seems like a good day to talk about the magic of dragons. Those powerful, wise and energetic beings of earth and fire, of air and water. And they're definitely attracting our magical attention at the moment. On Tuesday, I went to the beach at West Runton for the first time since the autumn. And I found a piece of driftwood in the shape of a dragon. Now, there are lots of dragons in Norfolk and in Norwich in particular. And some people even call Norwich a dragon city. And one of my personal favourite dragons is the Spandrel Dragon, who gave her name to Dragon Hall on King Street, just outside the, the main part of the city centre. And another that I'm particularly fond of is the dragon on the Ethelbert Gate, who appears to be facing St George across the cobbled road into the Cathedral Close. Now, of course, the dragon rarely fares well in the stories of St George, at least in the well-known stories. But Chris Wood has considered the matter of St George and dragons in great depths and he's here today to share his understanding of the complexity of that mythology. Hello. Hi. So, tell me a little bit first about St George and the dragon and the fact that maybe St George doesn't always necessarily have to kill the dragon. Well... Slaying the dragon is, of course, what George is most famous for. But that's actually quite a late element in the story. Um, his f story of his martyrdom uh, is a long series of him being put to death in horrible ways and then springing back to life. And there perhaps is a hint that uh, we'll come back to later about uh, his, uh, his special powers, if you like, as a saint. But the killing of a dragon is, as I say, what he's most famous for. But the interesting thing is that in the pictures showing him, he's usually in the act of perhaps killing the dragon, but maybe also pinning the dragon. Usually on horseback, he has his lance or sometimes a sword, and he's got that sticking in the beast's mouth. At this point, however, the dragon is still alive. There are representations that get confused with St George sometimes, and that has a, another figure, military type figure, usually with a sword and the corpse of a dragon at his feet. This guy is different though, because he's got wings. That's St Michael the Archangel. Rather different story. George, usually on horseback, horseback but not exclusively, doesn't usually have a dead dragon in his feet. He has a dragon that's still livid. Yeah, and of course there are there are three major dragon saints, aren't there? Because we have we have Saint George, and then as you say, we have Saint Michael, but we also have Saint Margaret, who's another really important dragon saint. And as part of her martyrdom, she was actually swallowed by a dragon and then burst out of its belly, um, making her, perhaps rather strangely, um, a patron saint of childbirth. And of course, she's another saint who's very important for the city um, and uh, works with St George in the Lord Mayor's procession, doesn't she? Well, traditionally, the St George's Day procession uh, had St George and he then became accompanied by St Margaret, although she was always seen in a bit of a strange light because some people interpreted her as the maiden that George was saving from the dragon. Um, now, it's not just modern feminist interpretations that have the, uh, the maiden being in, in control of both dragon and George because 
if you look at the story of the Golden Fleece, when uh, Jason, who sort of performs a George role, turns up in Colchis, the maiden, Medea, is the one that actually gets the fleece for him. So we've got lots of variations on this tale of big strong man hero who comes and uh, defeats the dragon. But what's he actually doing? And there does seem to be a lot of evidence that at the root of it is controlling these natural forces that are embodied in the dragon. Powerful forces, the ocean, the river, the desert. These are forces that humans need to be able to control in order to do things like grow food. George is very much a figure of agriculture. And in Central Europe, he's Green George, an agricultural saint, if you like. How how closely linked would you say that Green George is to the Green Man? It's a modern link because the Green Man is uh, a modern figure. Powerful for that, but still a modern figure. And every generation remakes mythology according to its needs. But George is a Green Man in a different sense. And he, he's actually linked to the Green Man of Islam, al Qadir who's this trickster figure uh, who also has powers of regeneration. Rather like the, the stories of George's martyrdom where he's regenerating, al Qadir has similar things going on. We have these figures who can control the wild forces of nature for the benefit of a civilization. And if we think beyond the uh, monotheist figures, we find storm gods such as Thor and Indra doing exactly that sort of thing. Thor's battling the Midgard Serpent and protecting civilization, and he's the farmer's god. This link between agriculture, keeping the storms at bay, if you like, whilst maintaining the fertility of the rain. We're talking here about control of natural forces for the benefit of civilization, not killing the dragon, but bringing it to our aid, if you like. Mm, it's interesting that um, that Mummer's plays are very much associated with St George's Day amongst other days of the year and, and often a theme within a mum, Mummer's play is that, that somebody, a knight or, or, or some other character is killed and then brought back to life very often by a doctor who has a potion which will cure everything. Yes, I mean, that's rather like al Qadir, who... Uh comes into contact with the waters of life, and it's this elixir. And the idea of a liquid potion that can bless, or equally can poison, is associated with dragons. Because dragons not only uh, breathe fire in many traditions, they sometimes also have a noxious breath. They can actually cause, cause drought and poisoning with their breath because they're natural forces and like fire fire can warm cook your food but it can also burn and destroy so it's about controlling things so that we can actually carry on doing what we want to do yeah it's interesting when you talk about controlling things because um one of the things that, that i find find interesting is that the dragon is often not allowed to go inside the church after a procession. I, I interestingly experienced this once myself. I was at a craft fair in Ludham, which took place within the church itself. Um, you know, in, in spite of, uh, you know, in, in, in Christianity, the idea of selling things inside a church might by some be considered to be dubious and, and, and not quite uh, in keeping with the teaching of Jesus, yes, who overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple. But nevertheless, at Ludham Church, that was, that was considered, um, it was considered fine to have a craft fair in there. However, as part of the festival, um, there were some children who who were dressed up in a, a magnificent costume to form a very long and beautiful Ludum dragon. And they danced in the churchyard, but they were not allowed to bring the dragon into the church to 
enter the craft fair or to enter the holy place. And, and that I found absolutely fascinating. And, I, you know, I was quite surprised because they, they were happy to have that dragon chasing the monk round the, round the churchyard, but they were not happy to have the dragon into the church. And, of course, that echoes what... what happened um, in the Norwich processions and I believe still does doesn't it when when the snapdragon who heads the the Lord Mayor's procession and headed the St George's procession when they were at that time of year uh, when 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 they reach the cathedral the dragon has to be left outside on the dragon stone and uh, St. St. Michael or St. Margaret and St. George rather were able to go into the cathedral but the dragon had to be left outside. That's right and there's still a stone by the uh, uh, west front of the cathedral uh, with that inscription on it I believe. Uh, but the interesting thing is that while Snap isn't allowed in the cathedral, he spends most of the year in St George's on Tombland. Yes, of course. So he he actually lives in a church, bizarrely. Yes. And uh, that church actually quite celebrates the fact that it's a bit of a, a dragon church. It's it's quite uh, far up the candle, quite Anglo-Catholic, that church. And uh, it's an amazing place to visit if you get the chance, St George Tombland in Norwich. And alongside Snap, there's also the very recent um, hobby horse style costume of St George on horse. Uh, that is part of the Lord Mayor's procession now. And uh, the horse is a, an interesting thing as well. Uh, there's lots of traditions where the dragon has various mammalian features as well as the reptilian ones, but there does seem to be a bit of an overlap with the horse. One thinks immediately of the Uffington white horse, that wonderful hill figure, which there's been a lot of debate as is it a horse? Is it a dragon? But also, if you think about St George, he's normally, not exclusively, but normally portrayed on horseback. And it seems to me that maybe the horse, a wild animal that comes to serve humanity, represents the tamed dragon. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and, and another interesting confusion about um, horses and dragons uh, is, is, in, is in the pendants that you brought, brought me many years ago from the Colchester Oyster Fair, which is a copy of um, a, a, an Eastern European Viking piece. And it could be a horse or it could be a dragon. Uh, it could also be either a boat or a cart, and, and, and some people have even suggested that it might be a teapot. But uh, it, it certainly attracts attention, and, and, and I wear it all the time, and I love that kind of the ambiguity of, of it, and that, that people don't really know what it depicts, and it, and it can be many different things to different people, which is, which is lovely. Absolutely. And that takes one quite nicely to the different shapes, if you like, of dragons. Dragons in the West tend to have a bit of a bad press through centuries of monotheism perhaps, uh, but I think before that as well, the idea of the dragon being um, essentially bad, which is why usually the dragon slayers are the good guys. But as you move eastwards, that seems to change a bit. You know, around the Caucasus, for instance, the you know the dragon is ambivalent, to say the least. You get as far as China and Japan, the dragon tends to be a very positive figure. It has some features in, in common, such as having a treasure, in that case the pearl. But it's usually seen as you know, a very positive force of nature. So we've got really the same animal, if I can use that term of it, also, in all places, uh, representing wild forces of nature, which can be beneficial to us as humans, but having danger associated with it. And just in different places, you've got a different balance between the good and the bad. There's lots of very interesting things which I don't think I've got time to go into now, but I actually just discovered recently a paper by someone called Robert Blust, actually published 20 years ago, which seems to be a missing piece that fits into 
the jigsaw of dragons and makes a lot of things make sense. His idea is that dragons actually derive from rainbows, which is why they're worldwide, because rainbows are worldwide. He points out that rainbow serpents are not exclusive to Australia, most famous from Aboriginal traditions, but they do crop up around the world, particularly in uh, pre-agricultural societies. And his thesis is that as agriculture develops and as states and nations centralise and cities develop, you get this distancing between the natural phenomenon and the mythology and you get the dragon and the rainbow is seen as something different which is why for instance in, in the bible the dragon pig can be at worst a symbol of satan and the rainbow is something very positive a, a sign from god of some uh, something good going on but if you actually look at this idea of the rainbow serpent often around the world with a, a head at each end that's mammalian horned very often, suddenly we've got the uh, ram-headed serpent that's on the Gunnstrup cauldron and is found in uh, various metalwork uh, in what's now Georgia. We've got the idea of the rain being controlled by this mythical beast. The rainbow isn't always seen as a positive thing. In some places, drier countries particularly, it's seen as a, th a bad thing that stops the rain. So that uh, putting the rainbow into the mix, we actually seem to find the, rain, uh, the dragon mythology fitting together because that also explains why it's the agricultural gods and saints that are there ready to control the power of the dragon because it's developed as agriculture has developed. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? We're going back to, to, to Ludham and particularly St Bennet's Abbey, of course, the story of the dragon there is, is that there was a dragon in Ludham who, who came out and, and menaced people, came out of his lair. Uh, and one day the villagers got so fed up with the dragon coming and causing trouble that they decided to roll a large flat stone over the mouth of the dragon's lair in in order to to stop him or her returning um and it, uh, presumably they hoped then that, that the dragon would disappear altogether from the village and indeed when the dragon returned from rampaging and and found the lair to be blocked off he or she went completely wild and and thrashed around and went down to where St Bennet's Abbey is and uh was never after that seen again but it's almost like the energy of that dragon is still there underneath the abbey and and it makes you wonder whether that doesn't have something to do with the fact that uh, um, that that a Coriza mill was built into the very heart of the gatehouse as if those people who were building it were trying to pin something down and you've got all of those associations with um with fire as well as with agriculture because because coriza um is 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 made from uh rapeseed which is obviously an important agricultural product locally, and it's also used to fuel lamps, and that was the main purpose of the Coriza Mill at St Bennett's, was for fueling lamps. So, so it's a fascinating kind of elemental and agricultural connection, isn't it? It is, and uh, a mill itself is an interesting uh, technology for using the forces of nature to change to benefit agriculture and to make something that we can eat or use in this case for for lighting our way uh, mill can be powered by the wind as in the case of well it's, the sails aren't there anymore but the one at St Bennett's Abbey uh, or indeed the water and to see a water mill in action particularly is quite a evocative thing I would say the power the power in that liquid element 
that forces the wheel around, which then in turn grinds the stones around. There's something very powerfully elemental about that. Mm, you, it, you can really understand when you watch something like that in action, you know, why, why there are so many stories for all of these kind of processes that humankind have developed, that they were originally given to us by the gods, as I'm sure they were. Absolutely, yes. And there are, of course, the, uh, there's the stories from the Finnish Kalevala uh, of the Sampo, which is this grinding machine that can, rather like the Holy Grail, produce whatever you want or need. Uh, we have the whole idea of the earth itself turning on the axis of the heavens around the North Pole and being that mill. Hamlet's Mill was the name of the book um, that uh, looked at ancient myths in, in light of the stars and their movement around the pole. Mm. And indeed, when, when you think about you know, abundance and plenty, I mean, that's, that's very much connected with the dragon energy, isn't it? Because, because dragons, you know, they're, they're often depicted as, as sitting on a great hoard of gold and silver and treasure. Um, and of course, you know, bringing in your rainbow connection, which you've recently discovered, of course, at the ends of the rainbow, there is supposedly a crock of gold, isn't there? Yes, uh, and a few years ago I saw for the first time a complete rainbow over the sea. And it's one of these things where the vision of something in nature gives a real clue to what's going on in mythology, I would argue, because at the ends of this rainbow there are what appear to be a broiling golden mass. Was it gold? Was it a pearl held in the claw of a, an eastern dragon? Was it the uh, rainbow serpent sucking up the water to rain down later? But there's something, a broiling golden thing at each end. Could be a crock of gold. But often the dragon magic isn't just something that, that you're going to, to randomly find. I mean, w from experience of working wealth magic with dragons, you always have to put in some effort as well. You, you can call upon them to help you um, if you're in need of, of, of money or resources of some kind. But it's always going to involve you in hard work. In, in, on, on those occasions when, when I've worked with a dragon in order to improve my financial situation, it's usually ended up with me getting a lot more work or a new job or something like that. You know, not finding a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Yes, because the, the dragon guards the gold. You know, the, the point of the, of the stories is that the hero goes and basically steals the gold. From the dragon. Um, whereas if we want to keep the dragon on side we need to uh, get the dragon on side and get the, uh, the dole out if you like that the dragon feels is more appropriate. And I think it's quite interesting that the city of Norwich, the dragon city, is also a lion city. The symbol of the city, if you look outside City Hall, Massive great lions standing there. And that goes back to the Middle Ages when uh, the king controlled a little bit of the city called the Castle Fee, around the immediate area of the castle. And that Castle Fee was marked by a special symbol which had the royal lion in the middle and around it circled wyverns. Now those in the uh, reconstructions that have done recently have Trans transmogrified into four-legged dragons, which is interesting given the dragons in the city. And when the Castle Fee became part of the city's jurisdiction, the lion moved and became the symbol of the city, but the dragon's still there, circling around the city and bringing its chaotic but necessary energy. You know, the lion's standing there, all pompous and mercantile, but the lion couldn't be doing that 
without the dragon's energy going around. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that, that Robert Topps, one of the greatest wool merchants um, of the city, uh, when he built his dragon hall, he chose to have the dragon symbol in there. And, of course, he hadn't called it Dragon Hall. That that name is, is, is a name given to it later. But but there is that dragon, and uh, and she is she is a wonderful um wonderful creature it's it's a shame that we can't see her so often now that mm. uh, dragon hall is no longer open to the public but but she's still there and I, and i think she's she's still such an important force within the city yes and one of the most prominent dragons these days in the city looks down on uh debenhams uh, from a mural that was actually painted as part of the business improvement district scheme so it's like you know some people are aware of what, what's going on, perhaps, not, maybe not consciously, but uh, we have the dragons, and they have a power. But it's a power that you have to respect. You can't just go in there and expect to take the hoard of gold without repercussions. You've got to respect the power of the dragon, work with it. Mm, and, and of course, you know, in, in other stories, it, it's very important to, 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 tr to endeavour to be as wise as the dragon and also to learn its name. Yes. An important part of its magic. It is. What is its name? What indeed is the <laughs> dragon's name? And on that interesting thought we'll leave it for today uh thank you chris thank you it was nice to talk to you and i'm sure we'll be doing more podcasts in future thank you thank you bye